Hello, I am Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have a wonderful presenter, Ms. Denise Levine, joining us today for this webinar entitled Accessibility in Grade Schools. Ms. Levine currently serves as a research assistant professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo in the School of Architecture and Planning. She also serves as the Director of Technical Assistance for the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center on Universal Design at Buffalo. Thank you, Ms. Levine, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. During today's webinar, the ASEF staff will be assisting Ms. Levine and all participants. At the conclusion of today's session, we will provide a list of upcoming events, and we encourage you to visit the site for future updates as well. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented, engage with the speaker, and add to your professional knowledge of accessibility in grade schools. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. Before I start the presentation, I just want to give you a little background on my experience specifically related to schools. Although I am a registered architect, I won't be given the presentation from the viewpoint of an architect who designs school buildings. I specialize in accessibility and universal design, and for the uh, past 16 years, I've been retained by attorneys to do assessments on facilities involving accessibility lawsuit cases. My work involving school accessibility has ranged from evaluating simple designs such as door handles, to doing single buildings, to entire school districts, to entire college campuses. For the purposes of this presentation, I'll just be talking about accessibility in grade schools K through 12. So the first thing we want to do is I just want to do a little survey and please indicate your role or position so sort of have a background on where everyone stands in, in their role in a school district. So based on what I'm seeing, it seems like everyone's involved in higher education. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of architects out there, which, which is absolutely okay. Um, that's great. And next I would just like to uh, ask you to indicate which age group of students you primarily work with. Okay, so everyone is, pretty much everyone is higher education. There are a few people uh, that are involved in high schools. So, okay. Okay, so here's a, a quick overview of the specific topics I'll be talking about. Um, the first few topics are technical, and I don't want to scare everyone away based on that, but they'll basically give you a little background on why we're even talking about this. And then once we get past that, I'll be showing you a lot of photos and walk you through some projects that'll put what we're talking about into context in real life design. So to start off, first we need to ask the question, why is it so important to provide accessibility in schools? Well, the most plain and simple answer that I can give you is, it's the right thing to do. Children with disabilities basically deserve the same equal opportunities to receive an education as children without disabilities. And the architectural barriers in school buildings shouldn't be the reason for denying those opportunities. A more elaborate answer is that basically federal legislation requires it. And there are four specific pieces of legislation that have prompted public school districts into making new buildings accessible and renovating ones that are inaccessible. And here's a couple that I'm going to walk through um, and describe. The first one is called the Architectural Barriers Act, and that was passed in 1968. And that required buildings and facilities designed, constructed, or altered with federal funds be accessible. And the ABA was the first time physical access to buildings was required by federal law. And although this law was passed in 1968, we still see so many school buildings built after that date that aren't accessible, which shows a major flaw in the initial efforts for disability rights. 
The second law, which is section, section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1973, was the first civil rights law guaranteeing equal opportunities for people with disabilities. And it established that schools receiving federal money couldn't discriminate against providing educational service to children with disabilities. It was passed by Congress, but ironically enough, vetoed by Richard Nixon. So it was not actually implemented until there were nationwide demonstrations and sit-ins by disabled activists to, fo to force the Carter administration to finally issue regulations in 1977. Unlike the ABA, which we said was about making the physical environment accessible, Section 504 ensures program accessibility. In other words, all aspects of a school program should be open to any child who's capable of participation in such an activity. Section 504 does not require that all facilities in a school be made quote unquote free or free. In fact, it allows programmatic adjustments to provide program accessibility as an alternative to making physical modifications. So the law specifically states that architectural changes are needed only when there's no other feasible way to make program or activity of, uh, accessible. The third law is probably the one you're most familiar with, and that's the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, uh, passed in 1990. And it's closely modeled after Section 504, but the ADA is a civil rights law that was adopted to pro uh, prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities. And there are five titles within that act, which you may not know about. So just for your own knowledge, I just wanted to run through quickly what the titles were uh, in case you ever encounter any of these. Title one relates to employment. Title III relates to places of public accommodation. Title IV relates to telecommunications. And Title V is reserved for miscellaneous provisions. Um, the title that's most applicable here to public schools is Title II. And Title II basically requires that state and local governments give people with disabilities an equal opportunity to benefit from, from all of the programs, services, and activities. And that includes the opportunity to a public education. So all state and local governments are required to follow specific architectural standards in the new construction and alteration of their buildings. So we'll be talking a little bit more about the ADA in a few minutes. I just wanted to move on to the last one, um, which is the last act of legislation, which is the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act of 75, which requires that disabled children are to be educated in the quote unquote least restrictive environment that is appropriate for each child. And in 1990, this law was amended and renamed the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. And the amended law also adopted something called mainstreaming as a federal law. And that stipulated that students with disabilities be integrated and educated together with students without disabilities. So as you can see, uh, these four laws form the framework for reversing discrimination against children with disabilities in public schools. And before we move on, I just want to share some interesting statistics with you that I found from the U.S. Department of Education regarding mainstreaming. In 2008, 95% of 6 to 21 year old students with disabilities attended regular schools. 3% were enrolled in special schools for students with disabilities. 1% were in regular private schools and less than 1% were in residential facilities, were homebound or in a hospital. That 95% of students attending regular schools is a staggering number and it basically reinforces the need for us to provide accessible schools. So if we look at this table, it illustrates that integrating children with disabilities into regular school curriculum and activities is actually more common than you may think. Based on data compiled in 2011 for all 50 states, 58% of students with disabilities between the ages of 6 and 21 that were enrolled in regular schools spent less than 21% of their time outside of their general class as opposed to only 15.1% that spent more than 60% outside of their general class. So basically that shows us that students are staying put. And with this growing movement towards mainstreaming, existing school facilities have to be renovated in order to remove or minimize architectural barriers. And continued existence of such barriers in schools not only restricts physical accessibility for disabled children, but also helps promote an atmosphere where disabled students are seen as different or reinforces the negative stigma typically associated with disability. So now that I've explained the legislation that's driven the movement towards accessibility in schools, what do we use to determine compliance? 
Based on the four acts of legislation that we had just spoken about, here are the standards and regulations that go along with them. So the standards used to ensure compliance with the ADA is something called the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards, also known as UFAS. And UFAS contains requirements for new construction and alterations also. And the scoping provisions within that standard indicate what has to be accessible. And then the technical provisions specify how access is to be achieved. For Section 504, the law also is enforced through UFAS. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is related to program accessibility. So it has no architect standards and is enforced by the Department of Education. The Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines, or ADAG, are guidelines developed by the U.S. Access Board in 1991 and were adopted by the U.S. Department of Justice for the construction and alteration of facilities so that they're accessible as required by ADA. They're actually derived from those UFAS standards that I mentioned for the ABA and the Section 504. I purposely skipped over the standards for the ADA because as of tomorrow, that changes. If you were designing a building today and getting your building permit today and the drawings were completed today, you'd have to comply with the 1991 ADAG. But as of tomorrow, the new 2010 standards will be enforceable and required for all new construction and alterations. Um, and some of you are probably wondering how that's going to affect existing buildings. If you have an existing building that was accessible under the 1991 ADAG, you don't have to all of a sudden make modifications. But if you do any construction or modifications after that March 15th date, you have to comply with the new standard. And yes, I know this is all very complex on paper, but in reality, it's actually even more confusing, even for those of us that do this for a living. Um, when we're involved in a lawsuit case, it gets really complicated based on when the building was built. As you know, most schools have been built and modified over time. And when we do an accessibility audit, we typically use the most recent version of the ADA standards, which we think is good practice. Uh, if it doesn't meet the standards for program accessibility, then we have to use the code that was enforceable at the time to identify any noncompliance. And if different parts of the building were built at different times, it can really make your head spin. Uh, it can get really messy. And then it's up to the lawyers to sort out what's applicable and what's not. And this confusion has created an entire industry of consultants and law firms that do nothing but sort this out. So now that we've acknowledged that this is all very complicated, I want to try and simplify it just for you, you know, for you just a little bit. Um, what do you need to use if you were going to construct a new school today and make it fully compliant? Of course, you need to comply with the new version of the ADA standards, which we just mentioned. And then additionally, all of the states have laws and regulations on accessible design. Some state codes reference other standards like ADAG, UFAS, or ANSI, although they may be using different versions of the standards. For example, uh, one state may reference ANSI from 1980, while others may reference the 1992 version. Other states address accessibility on their own with special accessible design codes. California, for example, has Title 24 of the California Code of Regulations, and they're designed to comply with the requirements of the ADA and other state statutes while other states have established accessible design boards that have power to issue standards, hold hearings, enforce compliance, and even certify plan examiners who review plans. A few municipalities have also incorporated accessible design laws or regulations in local building codes. This is a lot more common in, in large urban areas such as New York City, which would rather maintain their old building code than use a state code. Additionally, each state has an education department that issues their own set of regulations and practices for schools within their state. Uh, for example, in New York State, we have a document called the New York State Education Department's Manual of Planning Standards for School Buildings. It basically provides school building construction standards, and included in that, uh, they have provisions for education of students with disabilities. The rules related to construction state that all plans and specifications uh, for the erection, repair, enlargement, or modeling of school buildings in any school district must be reviewed and approved by the Facilities Planning Department. So once again, as you can probably see, the differences across the country present quite a challenge to architects who work outside of their local area and also to many businesses that operate nationally, such as you know chain stores and, and restaurants. Additionally, 
the burden on designers to assimilate and understand this huge amount of information is really significant. So as I previously mentioned, I mentioned ADAG and I also mentioned the new 2010 ADA standards, which are standards used to ensure the compliance of the ADA. Uh, I often get asked by other architects about the ADAG and the fact that they've heard that there's an ADAG for children's use and they want to know what it is, how it differs from the regular ADAG and whether they have to follow it. So I thought it would be beneficial for me to run through it since it would be applicable to anyone that works in schools uh, with children younger than 12 years of age. The ADA guidelines are based on adult dimensions and anthropometrics even though it covers buildings that children use. Although there were no specific requirements based on children's dimensions in the 1991 version of ADAG, it did include a provision called equivalent facilitation and that permits a departure from ADAG requirements as long as it provides equal or greater access. And although the ability to stray from certain requirements to accommodate for children's dimensions is allowed, architects and designers have always sought guidance in this area. So in response to that request, in 1998, the Access Board developed guidelines for building elements designed specifically for children's use, and they were integrated into the text of the guidelines as exceptions and have been brought over to the new ADA standards also. Um, they have not yet been adopted by the Department of Justice as standards and therefore are not currently enforceable. But whether these guidelines are used or not when a project is used primarily by children is really left to the discretion of the designer and client. Um, at this point, they're purely advisory and provide guidance in providing access to the various um, types of facilities that they cover. So to quickly illustrate a few of the um, differences between what the ADAG says and what the exception says, uh, I've made this chart to show you using drinking fountains, sinks, and water closets as examples. Um, the difference in the technical requirements for drinking fountains is basically related to clearances and spout, uh, spout heights. The requirement for uh, clearances is that the cantilevered units have to have a knee, a knee space between the bottom of the apron and the floor of at least 27 inches high, 30 inches wide, and between 17 to 19 inches deep. They should also have a minimum floor uh, space of 30 by 48 to allow a person in a wheelchair to make a forward approach. And additionally, spout height uh, could be no higher than 36 inches high measured from the floor. The exception states that these clearances are not required at units primarily used by children 12 and younger if there's a clear floor space for a parallel approach and the spout is no higher than 30 inches above the floor. And for sinks, there are guidelines for mounting heights and knee clearance. The requirement states that a sink has to be mounted with the top rim no higher than 34 inches above the floor and that there be a knee clearance of at least 27 inches high, 30 inches wide, and 19 inches deep. In this case, the guidelines actually provide two exceptions. Exception one states that sinks used primarily by children age 6 through 12 can have knee clearance no lower than 24 inches high, provided that the rim or counter space is no higher than 31 inches. Exception two states that sinks used primarily by children ages five and younger are not required to provide any knee clearance if there's enough clear floor space for a parallel approach. And then finally, you can see the differences between the design of accessible water closets, not in stalls, and the exception for those used primarily by children 12 and younger. Through each design feature, I'll just summarize this by saying, that in the design for children, the toilet is located closer to the wall and the toilet controls and toilet paper dispensers are all lower. Okay, now we'll move on and talk about some of the most common accessibility problems. Many schools often turn their attention to the interior of the building and often forget that before children can use the building, they have to have an accessible route to get to the building. And oftentimes you'll see sidewalks and paths which have loose or uneven surfaces such as sand or cobblestones and those types of surfaces require a person in a wheelchair to exert a great deal of effort to move along them. Um, similarly, abrupt changes in level like heaving or cracking concrete are not only obstructions to wheelchair users but can also be dangerous um, as they're tripping hazards to everyone else. So these two photos illustrate those problems I just mentioned along sidewalks. Uh, the first photo at the left shows the sidewalk heaving as a result of tree roots growing underneath and the photo at the right shows the grass extending into the cracks of the sidewalk directly in the path of travel 
Um, both circumstances can result in serious, serious injury if someone were to trip. Many older school buildings are raised high off the ground with large staircases at the entries. Stairs either outside or directly inside of entries make it difficult for some students to get into school buildings. And often in these situations, school ma schools make an effort to modify an entry and provide no-step access, either by removing the stairs or regrading or providing a ramp. But many, many times we see it done at the back or the side door. And that means that students that need a barrier-free entrance are relegated to entering the building apart from their general student population, which really does not promote equality for all. And here are three photos showing this condition of entries with stairs. All three are obviously photos of older buildings. The last photo is particularly interesting because that small blue sign, I'm not really sure if you can see it, but the small blue sign to the right of the door says visitor's entrance, and yet there are three steps up to the door. Um, this is an entrance that's on the side of the building, and the entrance at the front of the building was the one that was actually modified to be made accessible, yet visitors are required to come through the inaccessible entrance, and that just doesn't make sense. And there's a misconception about playgrounds, that they're only for children that could run, jump, and play. Um, therefore, many school playgrounds are not designed uh, with disabled children in mind. And one of the most common problems is that paths which lead to playgrounds and play area ground surfaces are often not paved or constructed of a hard surface. Um, not all children classified as having a disability use a wheelchair, and those that are capable of walking may have difficulty on unstable and uneven surfaces. Um, additionally, many schools don't have play equipment that's usable by disabled children. And these two photos show playgrounds that are not accessible to anyone that uses a wheelchair, whether it's a child coming to play or an adult uh, coming to watch their child. Um, the playground on the left has a surface that's made of a wood chip type of product, which is very unstable. And additionally, there's no pathway to get to the play equipment. I'm not sure if you can see this, but if you look at the fence, you see that red uh, slide, and then to the right there's a fence. And right next to the fence is a little mud or dirt path that leads down to the playground. That's actually the path that most people use. Um, the photo on the right has a similar type of situation. Uh, there are no paved walkways to get into the play area, and none of the areas are paved um, through it. OK, doorways sometimes pose, pose obstacles to a uh, disabled student's ability to move through school buildings. If the area adjacent to a doorway has insufficient maneuvering space, or if the doorway is too narrow for a wheelchair to pass through, it severely limits where that student can go. Um, another common issue is that the hardware found on most school doors, which is usually knobs, is us uh, difficult for children with impaired muscular coordination to operate because a firm grasp is needed to turn the knob. Um, also, children with limited strength cannot exert enough force required to move through open doors if door closers are set um, at too high of a force. Um, some closes shut doors so quickly that children who move slowly can't get through the doors fast enough, even if they can open them by themselves. And here are uh, a couple of doors that I wanted to show you. The slide on the left shows uh, a boys' bathroom in an older junior high school building set back in an alcove. Uh, the doorway is clearly too narrow, and the alcove limits the amount of maneuvering space outside of the door. Um, the middle photo is of two classroom doors in a more recently built high school building. Uh, the door at the right in that, in that photo provides no latch side clearance at the door uh, for a student in a wheelchair to position their wheelchair to open the door from the push side. Um, because the door has both a closer and a latch, the door should have at least 12 inches of space between the edge of the door and the adjacent wall. And I included this last photo on the right because I wanted to touch on one more topic related to doors. Um, in almost all of the school accessibility audits I've done, accessible room signage is always one of those items that is lacking, yet it's probably one of the most easiest and inexpensive accessibility requirements to comply with. The doors on the left in those photos aren't even close to being comp compliant, but the school with the door shown at the right actually made an attempt to provide accessible storage, yet they mounted most of their signs in the wrong place. and. As in this photo, the sign does not belong on the door itself. It's typically found on the latch side clearance uh, so that a person with a disability uh, has some consistency, um, as blind people, with where to feel on the, on the latch of the door to, to find the sign. Uh, in terms of circulation, there are many hazards along hallways in schools that can injure a student. 
and people with visual impairments are probably most suspect to um, having to encounter these circulation hazards. Um, they can easily bump into uh, obstructions or objects that protrude into the path of travel. Um, these can include coat hooks, wall hung display and trophy cases, etc. Um, if these objects are unexpected and mounted out of the range of detection by a cane, someone can really, really injure themselves. And here are some photos of typical examples of the kinds of hazards that may be present in a school building. The first show to, photo shows uh, an overhead wall-mounted cabinet that's extremely dangerous to a visually impaired person. Um, because the cabinet is mounted too high to be detectable by a cane, the person wouldn't know that it was there and could potentially hit their head. Um, this would be categorized as an overhead obstruction. And just as a side note, the requirement is that there be headroom of at least 80 inches. If that dimension is reduced to anything less than 80 inches, there should be a barrier underneath to warn a visually impaired person. Um, the second example is of a wall-mounted fire extinguisher that would qualify as a protruding object. The accessibility code states that an object projecting from walls uh, with their leading edge, meaning the bottom edge, between 27 inches and 80 inches above the floor cannot protrude more than four inches into a hallway, corridor, passageway, or, or aisle. Um, this clearly protrudes more than four inches into the hallway. And the last example is of a computer workstation in a school library. This would also qualify as a protruding object because the leading edge, which is the bottom edge, is between 27 and 80 inches, but it protrudes more than four inches. Um, now we move on to auditoriums. Um, because of the design of most auditoriums, it's difficult for many disabled children to fully participate in assemblies and other events that take place. Aisles are often sloped to increase visibility from the seats to the stage, but this also prevents most disabled children from moving independently through the room. Um, when stages are raised, and the only way to get to them is by climbing stairs, it's difficult, if not impossible, for children to take part in any onstage activities. Um, additionally, in most auditoriums, there's no space where children in wheelchairs can position themselves without being in the aisle, and they often have no choice as to where to sit. They're either forced to sit in the very front of the room or in the very uh, back of the room. And the photo on the left is of a high school auditorium that's clearly in need of being updated. Um, not only are the seats in poor condition, but there's no space for wheelchair seating and no access. able to access the stage. And when it comes to libraries, furnishings cause the most significant obstacle to disabled children's use of the space. Aisles between the bookshelves are often too narrow, and tables are usually placed so close together that maneuvering through the library space in a wheelchair is often quite a task. Um, additionally, because space is usually at a premium, high bookshelves are used and any items on those shelves are out of reach. And that's not only um, true of children in wheelchairs, but also true of elementary school children or um, shorter children. And these three photos illustrate some of the problems I just mentioned. Um, narrow aisles, tables placed too close together, and high bookshelves putting items out of reach. Okay, and now we'll talk about ramps. Uh, children who aren't able to climb stairs may use ramps either within the building or outside of the building. And even if a ramp is built to compliance, it still may not be usable. Um, the codes say that ramps are required to have a slope of no more than 1 to 12, but research has proven that even this slope may prove difficult for a person using a manual chair, uh, even more so for a child. So um, what we try to do is is have the shallowest possible ramp you can possibly have. And additionally, handrails on ramps that are mounted too high or that the gripping surface is too large um, may not enable a child to get the firm grasp needed to support themselves safely. And here are a series of photos showing the same ramp but taken from a variety of angles. And this particular ramp was built at a school entrance that they designated as the accessible one and it has all kinds of problems. And just to name a few, um, there's only a handrail on one side. The lower run is steeper than 1 to 12. There's no level intermediate landing because they have it curving, but it actually still slopes. 
Um, the handrail that is provided doesn't extend the whole length of the ramp, and there's a very sharp drop off on the side of the ramp uh, without a barrier in place to prevent the wheel of a chair from falling off the ramp. Okay, cafeterias. Eating lunch can often be difficult for many students with disabilities. Food service lines are usually too narrow for wheelchairs to pass through, and the reach for trays, silverware, and food can often be too high and too far. Um, additionally, most cafe cafeteria tables consist of seating that's not amenable to a person in a wheelchair. And the next slide shows two typical examples of cafeteria seating. The photo on the left shows individual round seats attached to tables, while the one on the right consists of long benches attached to tables. Uh, I understand why many schools use this type of seating. They actually prefer it because of the ability to be folded up and moved away. And this provides a very high level of flexibility for them using the space, as shown in the photo on the right. Um, based on the presence of the stage, this space obviously doubles as an assembly space. But when it's used as an eating space, it becomes totally inaccessible for a person using a wheelchair. Uh, many schools, particularly older ones in urban areas, are located in multi-story buildings. And the centralized facilities, such as the gym, the cafeteria, and the auditorium, are often on more than one floor. And children who use wheelchairs or those that cannot climb stairs easily are excluded from being able to access those areas. And I will show you a photo. So this photo shows an auditorium seating in a school building without an elevator. Um, as I said, anyone who cannot climb stairs to the second level is forced to sit on the first level. And since this particular auditorium has no designated uh, accessible seating, um, the student would either have to sit in the very front of the room or the very rear of the room. Okay. Often locker room facilities are not easily usable by disabled children. Uh, aisles are often too narrow for wheelchairs. Combination locks and thumb latches on locker doors are difficult for children with motor coordination problems to operate. And hooks and shelving are frequently out of reach. Um, and if they if these locker rooms do contain toilet and shower facilities, uh, they're usually not accessible. And here are two photos of locker rooms that pretty much show some of the problems that we just described, although another one that I did not describe is, is clearly visible in both, uh, a very wet and slippery floor. Um, this poses a problem not only for the child with a disability, but for any child that may lose their balance and fall. Uh, I just want to point out one one thing in the photo to the right, uh, they've provided this very nice bench in front of the lockers for someone to, to sit while getting dressed. But that eliminates any possibility of a student in a wheelchair being able to approach the locker and use it. And in most schools, toilet facilities are not usable by children with disabilities because the toilet is too high. There are often no grab bars. Sinks are difficult to use. Paper towel and soap dispensers are out of reach, and the mounters are, mirrors are typically mounted too high for a, a person who is in a seated position to see themselves. Uh, additionally, if a child needs help, there usually are not stalls which are large enough for an aide to accompany and assist a child. And these photos illustrate some of those problems. Uh, in the first photo, the toilet paper dispenser is clearly mounted out of reach. In fact, it's above the grab bar, which you typically don't see. Um, in the second photo, this particular school decided they would remove the doors to the stalls to try and make it more accessible. But there's still not enough clearance. The toilets are mounted too far away from the sidewall. There are no grab bars. The sink is not usable. And there's no privacy. Um, in the last photo, this pro, uh, bathroom has pedestal sinks, which are not allowed under the code. And the mirror and soap dispenser is mounted way too high. In the diagram that I'm showing you now, it's obviously a much older and outdated uh, drinking fountain. But I thought it would be a good example because it really illustrates some of the problems that you would commonly find with drinking fountains. Um, they could be mounted too high. Often they have uh, piping or a base that prevents a person from making a forward approach and controls that require a great deal of force to activate. And although we're seeing more and more modifications done to drinking fountains, because they're really considered a quick fix, 
uh, we're still seeing some of these leftovers that are completely inaccessible. Um, they're too high, they don't provide any knee clearance, and the controls are difficult to use. Um, the solution to providing drinking fountains for everyone is to provide what you uh, sometimes see called a high-low fountain, where there are two fountains at different heights. Uh, one is higher for standing users, and one is lower for children or a person using a wheelchair. Since the majority uh, of students spend uh, their days in classrooms, as we saw from uh, that, that table that I showed you before, it would make sense that they be usable. But some classrooms, especially those that are used for science, home economics, and art education, have counters, sinks, and storage cabinets that are too high to use. Uh, additionally, furniture is often arranged in a way that would make it impossible for a student in a wheelchair to maneuver freely around the classroom. And this photo is of a high school science classroom. Like many technology and science classrooms, work surfaces are often too high, and because of the base cabinets, there's no knee clearance for a person in a wheelchair to make a forward approach. At least one should be at a lowered height for a student in a wheelchair to be able to approach and use it. Um, and when we talk about science classrooms, another issue that we've run into many, many times is the problem with fume hoods uh, being too high and out of reach. Okay, now I want to move on to something called universal design. How many people, uh, how many participants have heard of universal design? Okay, that's great. Um, based on the results of the survey, almost all of you um, have heard of it. Um, although some of you may know it as inclusive design, lifespan design, or design for all. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanted to quickly define what the term is and how it relates to the design of schools. Um, before we talk about what universal design is, I want to talk about what it's not. It's not accessibility. Um, many people view universal design as a new term for accessible design, but they're not to be used interchangeably. Um, accessibility is a legal mandate and, as we discussed earlier, is driven by legislation and guidelines, whereas universal design has really no predefined minimum level of compliance. Um, in fact, universal design originated out of a critique of accessible design and is really a more comprehensive philosophy. Um, the term was coined in the mid-1980s by Ron Mace, and it's a strategy intended to be incorporated into all facets of product and environmental design, including the design of schools. Um, the formal definition developed, and I'll read it to you, is products and environments that can be used effectively by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So basically, what does that mean? It means that it does not discriminate towards any particular group and increases usability and safety for everyone. Um, this is particularly relevant to the design of schools because the population of students that attend schools is so diverse in every way, uh, physically, intellectually, socially, culturally, etc. So you can't possibly design for everyone by following the accessibility codes because each, each person's needs are so different. Um, additionally, the accessibility codes are in place primarily to accommodate people who use wheelchairs. And that's part of the problem right there. People who are unable to walk are not the only people who experience, experience difficulties in certain environments. Um, there are people with vision impairments, sensory impairments, people who have difficulty walking because of arthritis, people who are obese, people who are really short or tall, or even people that have temporary disabilities like a broken leg or a sprained ankle. Um, the simplest example that I can give you of universal design is to use a doorway as an example. Um, the ADA guidelines require that a door provide a clear width of at least 32 inches wide. So that means if clearance is 32 and a half inches, it would comply. If it's only 31 and 3 quarters wide, it does not. So when you're doing an accessibility audit, you can use a checklist to go through a building and see what complies and what does not. It's pretty black and white. Um, whereas universal design, on the other hand, you can have as little or as many features as you're interested in including. If you have 5, 10, or 20 universal design features, the, the building will still be more usable than if it had none. And I mentioned this uh, at the beginning of the slide, that accessibility has guidelines and universal does not, but we're working on it. Um, we're actually in the process of developing universal design standards 
um, for commercial buildings that will be applied on a voluntary basis. Um, buildings that meet the UV standards will receive a certification much like uh, buildings receiving LEED certification uh, from the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, and once those are completed, we plan on moving forward and developing standards for housing and schools. Okay, so now that we've discussed the most common accessibility problems, I wanted to show you some fun things and show you some examples of projects that are good examples of integrating accessibility into the overall design. Uh, in some cases, mostly the newer buildings, accessibility was provided initially, while others have been modified to provide increased accessibility. Uh, keep in mind that some were modified with accessibility in mind, but the architects were also able to incorporate some level of universal design to improve the overall uh, usability for everyone. Many school districts, especially those in large cities, have buildings that are more than 50 years old. A common complaint is that it's difficult to implement accessibility in such old buildings. I often see that issue when it comes to doors and door clearances. Um, where doorways don't provide the adequate clearance, it's not always as easy as just widening the opening and installing a new door. In many old buildings, the exterior walls are constructed of limestone or sandstone and can be up to two feet thick. They can't be easily widened um, or without there being a very, very high cost and effort associated with it, um, which would be seemingly a simple modification. Uh, another issue is that many classroom doors in old buildings are set back off the ha hallway in an alcove uh, as a way to eliminate doors swinging into the hallway. And we saw that in one of the photos I showed you, uh, a door to a, a boy's bathroom. Um, this basically eliminates any maneuvering clearances at doors. And those maneuvering clearances are required at doors that are not automatic or power assisted to allow a person in a wheelchair to be able to pull or push the door open and then be out of the way of the door um, as it swings. Um, so the solution to that problem is providing power actuated doors that open with the push of a button. And the two examples of the doorways shown in these photos are from newer buildings, but as you can see, uh, they do include power doors that are activated with a push pad. Um, this not only benefits a person using a wheelchair, but other students carrying books, someone pushing a baby carriage, a delivery person pulling a dolly stacked with boxes, etc. So this is a good example of a universally designed product, um, a, a power actuated door that would benefit everybody. Okay, the next photo you see is of a renovated plaza at the front entry of a high school building. The original design included a, a grand entry stair that was elevated about four feet above grade and all the other entrances in the building were between three and four feet above grade. So making an accessible entrance prom, proved uh, extremely challenging. Um, the solution turned out to be this really wonderful plaza that kept the overall concept of the grand entry stair intact, but included walkways on either side that gently sloped away from the building and an accessible entrance. Um, additionally, I'm not sure if you can see it, but um, new stairs were cut from the plaza level to those sloping walkways uh, so that there would be access from many different levels. Um, and if you notice, there are many able-bodied students using the sloped walkways because they actually find it more convenient. And this is another high school building that originally had two front entrances and both had stairs. Uh, the entrance that you see in the photo uh, had a wraparound concrete staircase that define the street corner and in order to provide an accessible entry the architects modified the entrance and they continued the intent of the original design at the street corner. Um, they replicated the stairs but they also regraded a portion of the plaza and designed uh, a slope walkway behind the planters that serve as the accessible route and that's to the left of the stairs if you can see that. Um, the nice thing about this design is that people who require an entrance without stairs are not relegated to an entrance around the side or the back of the building. Everyone basically enters and exits through the same location. And this is an interesting photo because it basically marries um, old and new. Um, the original building that you see in the background had stairs at each of the three front entrances which were at either end and then there was one in the middle beneath that tower portion. Um, when it became apparent that the building was going to have to go through extensive modifications to provide accessibility into the building, 
it was deemed as being too costly and difficult to stay within the existing footprint. So instead, this new addition at the front of the building was constructed at the main entrance. Uh, it not only provided an accessible entry, but also added much needed square footage to the existing uh, footprint of the building. And this photo shows new uh, aluminum elevated bleachers that were recently installed at a high school to replace the existing concrete grandstand bleachers. Um, the reasons the concrete bleachers needed to be replaced were twofold. Uh, first, they were in serious need of repair because there were areas of concrete that were cracking. Um, and secondly, they didn't provide enough uh, accessible seating. Um, people in wheelchairs were forced to view football and soccer games from grade level and their views were often obstructed by fence posts or other people uh, walking by or just standing in front of them. Um, it was determined by this particular school that it would be more, more cost effective to replace the bleachers than try to accommodate the accessible seating through uh, modifications. Um, so this particular school district didn't see the required modifications as a negative. In fact, they embraced it as an opportunity to improve seating for everyone. There are more seats and better lines of sight for everyone. Uh, on the far left, you'll see that there's a, an accessible ramp that provides raised seating for people in wheelchairs. And the viewing locations for people in wheelchairs are scattered uh, to provide them a choice in where they want to sit. Um, another advantage that was mentioned to me by this school was um, they find these new bleachers to, uh, to not be much maintenance and they think that it'll reduce their overall operating costs over time. This photo shows an elementary school playground that was recently renovated to provide um, an accessible path of travel to the equipment. Uh, the surface beneath the equipment previously was a loose gravel and it was replaced with this synthetic smooth rubber surface. Um, additionally, as you can see at the bottom of the photo, there's a concrete sidewalk that leads to the public right away. Okay, one point that I want to make is that oftentimes architects, designers, and space planners feel that the requirement for accessibility just gets in the way of good design and severely limits their creativity. And this really does not have to be the case. Um, although it is sometimes challenging to incorporate accessibility into existing spaces, it can also bring some unexpected excitement to a space. And a good example is what's happening in these two photos. Um, this is a three-story high school with an existing exterior courtyard, and there was previously no access between floors. Instead of finding a space within the existing building footprint to add an elevator, the architects decided to enclose the courtyard, convert it to indoor usable space, and add the elevator within the space. Uh, the photo on the left is a construction photo showing the structure of the elevator shaft and the concrete second floor. The ground floor houses new technology classrooms and a, and a cafeteria, and on the right you see that the second floor became a new library. The new library is enclosed with a fabric structure above, and you'll see that the elevator is at the rear in red, and the combination of the fabric structure and the high ceiling and the glass elevator makes it a very attractive space um, and it also updated a very old building. And this is a photo of a ramp that ties an existing building into a new addition. The existing building, which is where this photo was taken from, um, was built in the 1920s and it had no entrances without stairs. Uh, this opening on the left was originally one of the entrances that led to a flight of stairs to get outside. When the new addition was constructed, that building was built with an accessible entrance at grade and the stairs in the old building were ripped out and the two buildings were joined together with this accessible ramp. And these three photos illustrate how designers can integrate ramps into a space so that they're both functional and non-obtrusive in their overall design. In the first photo at the left, um, this hallway connects the cafeteria, which is at the bottom level, with the classroom level at the top. Um, the stairway originally spanned across the entire width of the hallway and not only was accessibility an issue, but as I said, the cafeteria is on the lower level and the storage area for dry goods is located in a room uh, at the top of the stairs around the bend from, from this ramp. And when transferring dry goods between the cafeteria and storage area with a cart, uh, cafeteria staff would often have to take a circuitous route through the building uh, to do it. Um, the addition of the ramp now makes it easier for everyone, and interestingly enough, 
I was told most of the students use the ramp uh, rather than the stairs just for its convenience. The middle photo shows an auxiliary cafeteria slash student lounge that was created within a largely unused corridor space. Um, the difference in height was so minimal that the concrete ramp was able to be integrated into the design of a space to provide accessibility. And this is often not able to be done because usually you have the change in level um, be significant that you have to um, make the ramp a little longer to get that well, 1 in 12 slope, but this was not the case. And the photo at the far right shows a space that was previously an outdoor courtyard and now has been converted to indoor space to connect two different parts of the building um, that are at different levels. And I think this ramp uh, fits nicely um, into the overall design. This photo shows a newly renovated auditorium and previously there was no accessible seating areas and somebody in a wheelchair had to sit at the very front of the room, directly in front of the stage or at the very back. Um, neither was ideal. Um, in this new layout, 30 fixed seats were removed and six handicapped seating areas are scattered throughout the room to provide choices in viewing location. Although the removal of 30 seats may seem like an unusually high amount for such a small room, it really increased the flexibility of the space. Um, folding chairs can be added in those locations when more seating is required. These two photos illustrate classrooms with accessible work areas. Um, the photo on the left is of a high school science lab and you can see the accessible sink which has the little uh, blue um, accessibility symbol on it. Um, it's slightly slower than the uh, adjacent countertop and as per the accessibility code the pipes below the sinks have to be insulated or protected and oftentimes you'll see the pipes under sinks wrap some type of pipe wrap or a soft PVC safety cover. Um, these are the least costly, costly methods at less than $10 for the foam and around $40 for the safety covers, although vandalism is always a really big concern in schools. Uh, so instead of covering the pipes, you'll often see shrouds under the sink, much like the one pictured here that still maintains the necessary knee clearance. Um, the photo on the right is of a technology classroom in the same building. Uh, it's a little tough to see in this photo, but along the right side, there are actually three levels of usable computer stations for more flexibility in use. Um, there's a lowered station at 32 inches, an intermediate height workstation at 36 inches, and then one located at 42 inches, which is the comfortable height for a standing user. And this is a really great example of universal design. So in conclusion, um, I hope this presentation has been both educational and informative uh, and has inf influenced you to think a little bit differently about the decisions that you'll make in whatever capacity you're involved in related to the design of schools. Um, the decision as to whether to include accessibility is not optional, but the decision for you to incorporate universal design is. So even if you don't apply every universal design concept I've touched on, applying some will still bring the building a facility that much closer to being accessible to a wider population. Um, and here are a few steps each of you might want to promote to take to promote accessibility in your school. Uh, number one, after this course, do some more research on your own to learn a little bit more about accessibility and what a disabled student experiences during a typical school day. Um, that may even involve simulating a disability like trying to travel through your school in a wheelchair. Um, I've done that with my students where I've asked them to pick a disability and given them specific tasks to do and then had them report back to me after they've spent a little bit of time um, as a disabled person. Number two, set up a planning group. And this could consist of disabled students, their parents, teachers, people from the facilities department, and anyone else that you think could contribute. Um, it also makes sense to find a local disability organization that could serve as consultants. Number three, I would say conduct an accessibility assessment of your school to see what areas need to be improved the most. This could be done by, um, you know, in a variety of ways, getting the help of students that face challenges, having someone from, from the facilities department do a general audit, uh, using a variety of checklists available online, or hire an expert. And number four, if your school doesn't already have an accessibility plan, assist in developing one. Um, this does not only relate to removing barriers in buildings, but also involves staff training, teaching and learning strategies, and policies for accommodating special requests, just to name a few. And for more information on universal design or other accessibility-related topics, um, you can see our website, which I've provided on this slide. Um, and I will go back to this after I show you um, the next slide.
with my information if anybody needs actually the website is on here so you can you can find it on here but um, this concludes my presentation uh, I know some of you may have, have may have questions and I'm I'm happy to take any general questions that anyone may have okay so one of the questions that I have from somebody is what advice would you give to a school trying to incorporate universal design into a historical building sometimes communities are very protective of historical sites how do you bridge that gap between need and nostalgia um, well actually universal design is something that you can start off very slowly uh, it would be good to go around your school and see the things that are easily um, changeable um, the one thing about implementing universal design is universal design is used to supplement accessible design you never want to change something that's going to um, decrease the amount of accessibility so you want to use it, uh, universal design as a tool to um, supplement it so um, I can, you know some of the things that you want to do uh, for universal design that would be easy to start off with is possibly create a wayfinding system um, as I mentioned before signage is a is a huge problem and if you comply with the accessibility codes um, you're really doing minimums because the accessibility codes are minimums um, not everybody speaks the same language not everybody uh, can see color as well as others um, so what we try to do is we do an overall wayfinding plan that accommodates people of um, people of all different abilities and people who speak different languages um, one symbol in one area um, culturally may not mean the same symbol in another cultural area so you want to be sensitive to that so I would say uh, my advice would be to start small there are plenty of um, publications and sources of information on universal design in fact we actually have a book that um, I was the editor of and wrote most of and um, that book is called Universal Design New York and that for that book we were hired by the city of New York to provide guidelines for uh, architects and planners on how they could implement uh, universal design in their city and what we've done is we've broken it down into is and um, bathroom facilities and signage and wayfinding and every area has been broken up so um, if you go to our website uh, and go to our publications list that publication is actually available for free download on our website so I, I think that would be a really good start um, hopefully I've answered that question um, another question is one of the most common ac accommodations is wheelchair ramps are there any new technologies on the horizon that will eliminate the need for winding sloping walkways um, actually I would I would in new construction um, I, I want to talk about um, sloping walkways sloping walkways are actually the best and most universally designed way to provide access into a building and the reason for that is that everybody would enter the building and be able to use that sloping walkway equally and and a ramp is considered anything above 1 to 20 in slope and a walkway is considered 1 to 20 or less and once you have a sloping walkway um, you don't need handrails um, it could be a little bit more expensive because there's regrading involved if it's an existing facility but when you're doing new construction um, uh, regrading and providing a no step entry through a walkway is actually the most attractive and most universally designed way to get people in a building so uh, let's see when using ADAG for children what are the difficulties for repurposing for a different age group if necessary since not required what are the pros versus building for the general population I've actually asked other architects why they choose to use the ADAG standards for children or not and most of them told me they don't and the reason they don't is because oftentimes they want um, number one the spaces to remain as flexible as possible and bathrooms that are located say near kindergarten class or first grade class or second grade class may not 
be used for that purpose down the road. And if they use these shorter fixtures, um, such as a sink or a toilet, um, it may decrease the flexibility of that space. Um, another thing that they've told me is that they don't want to use smaller toilets because when younger children um, uh, are home, they're not using shorter toilets and they feel that um, they should keep, keep it as consistent as possible. So uh, I, I talked to probably a half a dozen architects that design schools and they've all told me that at this point they haven't really to use them unless the client uh, the client wants it and that's when they're you know whether they're doing a daycare center or a preschool um, but when they're doing grades you know K through 12 they haven't used them um, I think we're at a time um, hopefully everyone enjoyed this um, you can see my contact information if anybody has any more questions and they want to email me feel free uh, I'll try to answer whatever questions I have um, thank you very, very much for participating in this, and um, thank you very much. ASAP would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Ms. Denise Levine, and our participants for joining our webinar today. Remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback. be folded up and moved away and this provides a very high level of flexibility for them using the space as shown in the photo on the right um, based on the presence of the stage this space obviously doubles as an assembly space but when it's used as an eating space it becomes totally inaccessible for a person using a wheelchair <laughs>